So it's time for the expert panel. Yeah. So why don't all the practitioners in the room come to the front here when we'll I'll get up more chairs that we need. While people are coming up, I'm looking around the audience, and once again, I'm the oldest guy in the room, okay? <laughs> but what that does, I appreciate. I watch the babies taking their naps, and as I get older, I appreciate naps too. So naps are important uh, coping tools uh, to help people get through the day, especially if you have SGIA, you know, your kids can fatigue more easily than other kids. And so sometimes naps are, are important tools. Um, I can remember, don't be shy, guys. Come on up to the front. So uh, in the old days, when we didn't have effective therapies. Uh, rest therapy was an important part of what we did for kids with rheumatic disease. So I think you should think about um, giving your kids access to rest breaks uh, so they can help pace themselves through the course of the day. Alexi, Hermina, you want to come to the front, please? Everybody come to the front. That's a provider. All right, so we're wide open to any questions you want to have. I think we, we can share. We, we have one here. We can. Uh... I guess I'll start with a question, not specifically SGA, but of course related. We had talked about it earlier with the sharing of information, but. As parents, what can we do to help share with our physicians? Now, we're lucky in that we're from Dayton. We can come down here to this wonderful facility, but there's folks here who may just have a general practitioner or someone like that. You had talked, uh, ma'am, about uh, research articles, and, you know, again, you don't want to put everybody through a CT scan just for the, the joy of it. Um, but how can we share that information with our general practitioners uh, no one cares more about our kids than we do. So what's an uh, appropriate way uh, to do so, mm -hmm. to get them the information? I imagine reading articles all the time mm -hmm. interferes with your job. But. Yeah. Well, I no. think it's, it's not realistic to expect general practitioners to read about subspecialty articles, right? The, uh, they have the full age range of patients and to read about on all the different problems. So. You can help if you find articles that are helpful to you or through your SGIA Foundation network, there are articles that are published. It's helpful for your practitioner if you actually take those in there and say, here's an article that's relevant to systemic JIA uh, that have been, has been found to be valuable and, and recommended, that sort of thing. So you can do the literature search for them and take them articles so that they can become more informed uh, in those articles. And um, that's one way. Um, the other way is I would encourage all of us here talk to physicians at outside institutions frequently uh, that have questions. So I would encourage you to share our contact information or give them the, our Cincinnati Children's Hospital number or the number for a pediatric rheumatologist in your region uh, that you know about. If you're not from here, but you have a pediatric rheumatologist that you know or see at some interval, uh, share that information, because we're very happy to talk to anybody who's taking care of a child with rheumatic disease and try to be of help to them in a particular situation. Maybe to add on, we do a lot of, um, there are only 250 practicing pediatric rheumatologists in the country. So most of them actually live in the Midwest. And why that is, we don't know for sure. But what we do very often is that um, we co-manage patients with um, other subspecialists who live further away. 
So we have uh, patients who come from Alaska to us maybe once a year or twice a year, and then we develop a treatment plan together with the doctor back home so that we are on the same page and do the best thing for a given patient. Yeah, I very much agree. Well, when my patients go and seek a second opinion some, somewhere else, I'm very happy about that because we are dealing with rare diseases. There are no strict rules how to handle those diseases. And I'm always happy when there is a fresh look at my patient and we can discuss, I can discuss the management with another specialist in this area. Uh, so it's sort of very characteristic of our field uh, in general. We, we, we like to talk to each other about our patients and a second opinion for us is great. We like this. I just want to throw a plug into the hard work done by uh, foundations such as the SJA Foundation. So maybe when I shut up, Rashmi can talk about what's going to happen from, the, from this conference and what materials might be available. But um, there's, there's materials on the SJA Foundation website. The Auto-Inflammatory Alliance has also been discussed. They have a, a website that... Um, the head of that, uh, Karen Durant, has uh, over many years curated a searchable, indexed, uh, really uh, fantastic resource that has information about not just systemic GA, but all of auto-inflammatory diseases with pictures and descriptions. So, so there are uh, online resources available through the foundations that I think are, are I mean, obviously I'm biased because we've helped contribute, but I think that they're really of good quality. I think it depends on the foundation. Uh, the content on our site is mostly from the events that we've organized and the videos, and some of sometimes we've uh, transcribed and created a question answer series based on the answers. Um, the Auto Inflammatory Alliance has done, uh, has both created content on their own from the patient's perspective, and they have done a lot of work with different doctors on kind of, you know, um, Small, like the cards that we have out there, those are actually more the creation of the auto inflammatory alliance. We kind of went along as the subject expert. So they've done a lot of that, and you should go to their site and take a look. I'm going to try not to cry when I ask this question, but I probably will, just as a warning. Um, how do you, my daughter's seven, so, and she has, she's the one that walks like this. So she has had to give up everything that she enjoys playing sports. How do you deal with that? When she knows she's different and she can't participate in things that she wants to, what do I tell her? Well, we are very sorry that, you know, the, the daughter is not feeling well and, you know, there's obviously room, well, there's certainly uh, room that we need to provide better care. Um, we had a little bit of problems understanding your co concrete questions oh, you were having. I can try it again. How do I explain to her or how do I manage her psychologically? You know what I'm saying? When yeah. she starts getting okay. down about not being able to do everything everyone else can do. Um, Dr. Ting alluded to that to some extent. What we having a chronic disease is, is difficult, both for a child, especially for a child, also for the parents. What we do over here at Cincinnati Children's, and I'm sure they do it also in, in Pittsburgh and other centers, we work together with pediatric psychologists to helping help them address their fears and help them with coping of the symptoms that are going on. In those therapeutic intervention, the parents are very often included because it's hard for you to see a, a child in pain or, as you said, if there's uh, poor behavior, what should you do? So um, there's help given in that way. So including a pediatric psychologist should be helpful. And in my experience, it has been for many of my patients. You know, it starts with what we think is trivial, a blood draw. But, it, you know, it's traumatic for a child to give them tools at hand, how to relax themselves. They're not, not so scared of it. And they don't uh, experience such a high uh, pain volume. I think it's also to 
important to expose your child to alternative sports, you know, the traditional sports of soccer, basketball, those sorts of things uh, are challenging for our kids and in some ways and sometimes even detrimental. But there are sports in which kids can participate, be competitive, and that sort of thing that aren't traditional sports. Swimming, uh, they can be on a, your daughter could be on a swim team. She may not be the fastest person there, but she's with other people. She's practicing, that sort of thing. Uh, archery, there's a number of alternative sports that, that uh, your daughter, I've seen her last night in the playroom. There are sports in which your daughter could participate and be a, on a team and all those sort of positive things that come from that, uh, even with hip flexion contractures. And the other thing I want to provide um, is a long view. Um, uh, we did a study many years ago when all our kids suffered and all our kids had disabilities and couldn't participate in even many of the normal school day activities. And we studied them as young adults. And they consistently achieved higher professional goals, more schooling than their siblings. And so being, very few of us go on to a professional soccer career. So soccer is very important when you're seven, eight, nine, ten. It can, you know, it's it's important, but very few of us pursue soccer professionally. Um, but all of us pursue and use reading and art and the things that can be substitutes that you have to do because your child can't do soccer. Those substitute things that are seem like second best at this point in the long run are gonna be more important for them to do well than, than being out on a soccer field. So I know that doesn't alleviate the sorrow you have now about your child not being able to do the things other kids do, but um, uh, many of these things you do as alternatives, including just spending time with you because they can't be on a soccer field, benefit them greatly in the long term as teenagers and young adults and adults. Thank you. Sorry for if crying, everyone. Um, <laughs> if your care is at a children's hospital, then they certainly will have psychologists trained in helping with chronic diseases. But um, I recently saw someone from Tennessee with a different problem but needing a psychologist. And we have in our clinic a dedicated psychologist who was able to help find someone in their area that deals with kids with chronic illnesses. Because it's a little bit different from you know, some other uh, therapy that they might need. So uh, if, you, if you need help finding someone, we, we might be able to help you find someone. But if you're at a major children's hospital or close to one, they're gonna have a good team of people. And I, I can speak both as a rheumatologist as well as a now adult with a chronic childhood illness. Adult? I'm, I'm <laughs> plus or minus adult. <laughs> Chronologic adult. <laughs> <laughs> um, on the importance of things like this to actually get to know other kids who are struggling with chronic diseases, which doesn't have to be the same chronic disease, um, but you feel like you're the only kid who's not a normal kid, whatever normal is, um, but um, being able to meet some other kids, even if it's not as severe as yours or not the same as yours, to be able to know that um, other kids are going through things like this too. So of groups like this, groups like the Arthritis Foundation, um, many regions have um, arthritis camps. Um, Dr. Belville has been involved in ours for over 30 years, I believe, um, where our kids have a week-long sleepaway camp, um, which is up north of Cincinnati, with just kids with chronic rheumatic illnesses. Um, the Arthritis Foundation, I know, has um, links to some of those as well. Um, there are many around the country. I know there was one in Nashville where I trained for my residency, or my, uh, my residency. Um, other ways to, for them to get to know other kids who are struggling with chronic illnesses. Uh, I agree with Dan. I actually, I'm very impressed how well my patients do in life, later in life. They start with enormous pain, uh, inability to participate in many, many activities at school. At the end, they do remarkably well. Just uh, this last year, I think I've written about a dozen of recommendation letters for colleges, and many of, this, of my patients are applying for nursing or physical therapy programs, and I'm sure they will be fantastic because they have the empathy that we may not have because they have gone through this kind of experiences. So again, I would like to stress the sort of some positives here. 
these kids, at the end, they do remarkably well, much better than I would expect based on sort of what I see uh, when I see them at the very beginning of the illness. They're also beautiful human beings because they do have the empathy and you know, we never have problems with our children being the bullies. We have children, our problems with our patients dealing with bullies, but never in my career of 30 plus years have I had one of our GIA patients be a bully because they just understand how difficult it is and how difficult it is for other people and they're immediately empathetic. So it's one of the things that strikes me about our summer camp, we get together 50 or 55 kids with chronic rheumatic diseases and the counselors go out of the way to volunteer for our group because they're such beautiful people that they're fun to interact with, they're supportive of each other, the older kids support the younger kids. So these experiences that you unfortunately your children have are learning experience for them to become much more sensitive and caring individuals than other kids that don't have to put up with this stuff. So there are some positives here. I wouldn't for a minute wish that your child has it, but um, there are some positives here that come from having to deal with a chronic illness early in one's childhood. So they learn and grow about being human beings in a, in a broader way than other kids do that don't have to put up with a chronic illness. While you're working to get to questions, I was just going to say one other thing. I mean, your children, sorry, your children are extremely resilient, and we don't get we don't get coached as parents. We don't know what it's what to do, what to say. I think just being there and trying to guide them into recognizing their strengths is one thing that you can do. Right? You can't. We can't fix it. We're trying to, but you guys are doing an amazing job. Just help steer them in the right direction. They'll love you for it, no matter what. I know. I know personally. Um, my son has a uh, GJ tube, and I too will try to keep from getting too emotional. Um, loves, loves, loves sports, and would love to be able to play football and baseball and basketball and all this stuff. But with his stomach tube, he can't take the impact. I mean, because anybody who knows anything about an S uh, GJ tube, there's a little bubble inside, and if that bursts, it comes out, and we got to get to the hospital right away. So, again, kind of springboarding off of what they said, having alternative sports, for example, my son now has an interest in golf. Great. He can play that the rest of his life. You know, those sort of things where we're going uh, we're gonna to talk to him about being able to do possibly doing soccer this fall. It scares me because if he gets a ball to his stomach, there's a chance we could be headed to the hospital that night for a tube replacement. I mean, you got to take it what it comes. But, um, you know, I, I would just say, um, you know, just encourage them to find what they really enjoy outside of a sports realm and just really, really encourage them in that because, um, yeah, it's, it's having something for them to do is important. You know, it just doesn't always have to be the traditional sports and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, it's disheartening. It really is. Um, there's I think been it's important, important to encourage them to try things too. Yeah, so you absolutely. never know what's going to absolutely. click. You know, uh, uh, my son had trouble with sports and uh, we tried different things and, and he fell in love with being in the theater. And so for him, even at a young age, that was something that he could do. Uh, he had trouble uh, with sports, so I bought him uh, an expensive bike that had gears on it so he and I could ride bike trails together. So when he went back on Monday, he may not be able to talk about his soccer game, but he could talk about the fact that he and I rode for 20 miles uh, on a bike trail, and other kids hadn't done that. So it gave him some pizzazz because he had done something athletic that was different than the other kids do. So you try different things with your kids. It doesn't have to be soccer. It doesn't have to be basketball. It doesn't have to be volleyball. Um, there are lots of activities that you can do um, to allow the kids to be involved 
uh, that aren't sports or there's a lot of alternative sports that kids with rheumatic diseases can participate in fully and intensively and get the same benefits out of it uh, that you expect the kids to get from sports. I just want to, one brief point. I just want to make sure that uh, the focus is so much on, on, the, on the children. Uh, I think it's important as parents not to beat yourselves up. Uh, by virtue of you being here, you're already uh, going well above and beyond uh, you know, what, what uh, we expect of, of parents to take care of uh, chronically ill children. And, and this, this terrible accident uh, that, that has occurred in your children is not your fault, it's not anybody's fault, but it's very taxing. Uh, and, and I see a lot of parents uh, have a hard time forgiving themselves and, and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, not self-destructive thinking. And so self-care, taking care of yourself, I think, is actually one of the best ways of uh, helping your children deal with the adversity as well. Mine is a, a question that might get some eye rolls because I'm aware of the, the uh, so, so it's a Wikipedia thing that I've always wanted to ask. So I'm aware of the danger of it. But I've always been curious about, uh, you know, when you first learn this disease, and I'm, 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 I'd, I would probably wager to say every person in the room has probably read this sentence in Wikipedia where it says, in the United States and Canada, mortality is estimated at about 4%, and in Europe, mortality is esti estimated at about 21.7%. <clears throat> so my question is, number one, is that true? Number two, is there, is, is there what, a, if that is, if it's not true, then end of discussion. This is a quick question. If that is true, I'm kind of curious on what would account for such a, a alarming disparity between those two numbers as far as, is it, is it medical care that they receive in Europe versus the U.S.? Is it the cluster fact or is it Wikipedia? So we should move on to the next question. So that's, that's, that's it's the question. because the American rheumatologists are much better looking. Um, no, I, I don't think that's, I don't have any sense that that's true. The, the patterns of practice in, in Europe are similar. Um, I don't know if the historical amyloidosis... Well, exactly right. That's what I was going to suggest, that uh, I think the number you are quoting is coming from the 50s and 60s, when uh, patients were dying with amyloidosis. Remember that complication that I mentioned that eventually disappeared. I don't think there is any difference right now between us and uh, European countries. Uh, I have, I, I have a different perspective. Europe is a very large, complex p place, and so there are places in Europe where access to care, both specialists and medications, is still very restricted. And so for those children, their management is more like it was here in the United States 20 years ago. So there are countries in which children with systemic GI can't get ready access to biologic therapy. So I think... Um, the treatment varies a lot from country to country in Europe. Uh, for most of the Western European countries, I would agree it's very much the same as, as here, the, both in terms of available treatments, access to specialists, and outcomes for the children. But there are places in Eastern Europe in which access to therapies are very restricted, and those children don't do as well because steroids play a larger role in their care, and you get into all the complications from steroids and from poorly controlled disease and that sort of thing. So I don't think it's 20% mortality even in the less developed European countries, but it, the outcomes are very different in one European country to the next. So this isn't really an answer to your question, but um, I recently heard from a graduating medical student who said that they felt like they should donate to Wikipedia because they learned more from Wikipedia than any textbook that they had read throughout medical school, so. <laughs> Maybe referring to the 4% mortality you're mentioning. I, so what contributes now to it is, is very likely the lung disease and also overwhelming macrophage activation syndrome. And as a third factor, possibly infection, but my sense is it's the first two, rather than any other complication of, of the medications that are given. And well, 
Probably the depends on the articles. medical editor of the journal. <laughs> so that's a relatively recent article, so I, it is worth looking into. But, but uh, most of us travel extensively in Europe, and we collaborate on every clinical trial we do with international sites. Uh, and so we know about the outcomes of children in different countries. And so I would agree with the other people on the panel that the outcomes for most European, Western European countries are exactly the same as they are here. Maybe we don't have concrete data, but Leah and I pray, like, you know, we play, pay pretty close attention to any cases that come through. Leah, is it your um, assessment that recently all the bad outcomes that we've heard of has been associated with the lung plus MAS? Recall, do you recall any MAS, like any, any other case? Not just MAS, no. No, no. So They've that's. All been lung related with an infection or MAS. Yeah. And actually what we've noticed is that like even like I think a week and a half ago, Leah pointed out someone to me who like a child's case to me who um, I don't know if they knew about the lung till the last stages, but it was. It's it's very clear and consistent. You hear about MAS plus lung and the bad outcomes. So Well, I'm glad to hear that you haven't in the last year heard about MAS fatalities, but it is it does still occur. We've heard it's, about it's, them. It's but in yeah. from other centers, I, so it is a potentially fatal complication of SJA that needs to be taken yeah. quite seriously. We are just pointing out that you know, and absolutely, you know, we don't have, we don't, we are not doing a grand survey. This is just the cases that are coming through. But it's been interesting that it's always in conjunction with the, some kind of a lung issue. Yes, yeah, so parents that joined the group, say, three to five years ago, most of them had lost children to MAS and infection. And like she was saying, this is a very small population that we're seeing in the parent group that are joining. But I would say all within the last two to three years have all had that lung component that they're starting to see in more patients. And obviously, like you said, they, they're seeing MAS um, deaths otherwise, but not in the parent group. So a couple of things may contribute to that observation. We now have, since 2016, actually, for the first time, criteria how to diagnose MAS better in earlier stages. So there might have been a problem with diagnosis in the, originally, and patients who died from MAS really had a very severe phenotype that almost no doctor could miss. So that would be one. There could also be now that there are more patients on, you know, there may be something in, in the environment too. It may be an interaction between both things. But that's exactly what I said in the beginning. We need to figure out what's going on because it's really a deadly complication. So it's up to us to find out what's tricking it, what are the risk factors, so that we can you know, be prepared and survey patients accordingly and then provide the most appropriate treatment. The observations you are making are very, very important. Well, and interestingly enough, and I think Rashmi can echo this, we've not seen the same thing in still disease patients because we're in those groups as well, and it's mainly MAS, even recently several cases. So it's interesting to see the observations between the two age groups. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for, for all everything that, that all of you all do. Uh, we're relatively new to the SJI world, so I apologize that this is already common wisdom or not. But I was just curious. We have a, in addition to our three-year-old, we also have a, a two-month-old at home. And I was wondering what the research may show in the prevalence of um, siblings uh, having uh, SJI or some other chronic disease. So I'll address it. We struggled for many years to develop a sibling registry here. Uh, for research because it's an ideal circumstance to look at genetic contributions to the disease. And we struggled greatly to find uh, families in which more than one child had the disease. Uh, in general, especially, for, uh, we'll see if other people agree, but for systemic J in particular, I would say the fact that one child has it doesn't put the other children in the family at increased risk for that disease. Now, some of the other more other types of GIA that are more autoimmune and based, uh, there is a slight increased risk for either GIA or other 
autoimmune type disease occurring in the family or in siblings. But for systemic JA, because it's a different mechanism, I'd say that there's no evidence that there's increased risk for siblings. Would other members of the panel agree with that? Yeah, I, I would echo that as well. Actually, we were discussing this the other day, thinking about twins, uh, twin studies, and in other forms of JIA, if you have an identical twin um, and you have JIA, your twin has a about a 30 or so percent chance of also having it, which is interesting because it says it's not entirely genetic, right? Because otherwise it would be 100%. Um, but it, it is somewhat genetic. In systemic GIA, the only set of twins that we know of, um, we actually found out with sequencing actually have a different disease. They have a genetic periodic fever syndrome. So this again says this is not, systemic GIA is not a single gene disease where you have a 50% chance or so of passing it on or, or having a sibling risk. Um, it's much, much less than that. And I guess that really speaks to there being a very significant environmental component to what causes this disease. We, and we, we actually were talking about this also yesterday, is what do we mean when we say environment? Well, we don't know. Something in the environment, it could be an infection that you get, it could be um, other chemicals in the environment, it could be things like the, the microbiome and what your immune system is, how it's responding to that, that there's something that needs, is required to sort of turn on the immune system and then it can't turn off. Um, that's I think that, that sibling data says that that is a really big driver of systemic GIA. I think there's two important corollaries to this question. One is, as a parent, and you're thinking about other children, the fact that your child has systemic GIA shouldn't influence your decision to have children or not children. Then the other thing that's important corollary is that your children are now too young to be worried about this, but once they become adults, and want about think about having a family on their own, then the fact that they have systemic J shouldn't influence their decision about having children or not having children. Those decisions, both for you and your spouse and for your children when they get to be that age, should be based on the same reasons that everybody else thinks about when they think about having children or not having children or two children or four children uh, is... Uh, those kind of considerations, then the systemic JA shouldn't drive the decision uh, at all. There is one paper describing a familial, familial systemic juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Scott, I believe you quoted that paper in your lecture today. If you read this paper, you will, you will recognize that it's not systemic JA. It's something completely different. It's a family from Saudi Arabia, and uh, the pathology to me is very, very different. It's not systemic JA. And we looked in a database of over 100 patients we've done exome sequencing at, and we didn't find that in a single one of our patients. been um, doing this for a long time. Okay, we mostly have young children here, and you guys have been doing this for long enough that you see children who have become adults. Are there fertility issues with um, the drugs that they were taking before steroids? I know we know there's a lot of side effects of steroids, um, but what about the new drugs we have, and do we have any information on that? And obviously, it might be different for females versus males. But what do we know about long-term side effects of most of the drugs that we're all taking in the room and how it affects fertility? So there is good data out for toxilizumab, or relatively good data. And it doesn't seem to have a long-term fertility effect or any effect on reproduction you know, with a history of taking it. Now, when you are taking a certain medication and, uh, you know, a a uh, woman becomes pregnant, then you know there needs to be certain counseling done. Many of the biologics we are taking can be taken even through pregnancy. Um, the medication that has a long-term effect on fertility uh, is cyclophosphamide, and the fertility effect occurs most in those um, patients who have entered puberty, and the effect is larger for girls than for boys. 
Methotrexate, what can you comment? Methotrexate has been found not to have a long-term effect on fertility. However, one should not get pregnant while taking the medication. After a washout of about three months, there is no effect whatsoever on the outcome of a pregnancy. And is that the same? Um, for all diseases, yes. Sorry, is that the same for males versus females? So clearly, yes. yes. So There's the males shouldn't be on methotrexate while trying to get pregnant, or only females shouldn't Actually, be I read a paper about that. There was always the story that males shouldn't be taking methotrexate you know, because it could have some birth effects on birth uh, on, the, on the fetus, but turns out methotrexate kind of makes the sperm sluggish and not as, uh, you know, is mobile and actually it has no effect on the outcome of a of a pregnancy so those warnings actually were way kind of you know reduced but for women uh, because methotrexate really affects how cells divide it's very important not to be on methotrexate uh, in the beginning of a pregnancy I guess my question is, if, like, would the pregnancy and childbirth trigger the immune system? We know the SGA is triggered by the immune system. Would, would that trigger the immune system? So during pregnancy, they would have a flare. During childbirth, they would have flare, would make it not safe for them to do? I think what you're describing is true for many other rheumatic diseases, particularly lupus. Uh, uh, in lupus, we have actually a marked predominance of females over males, and we believe that the hormonal background is playing a major, major role. I think systemic GI is different. Um, if you look, sort of, we actually can count, but uh, our impression that it's actually male-female ratio is almost 50-50. So that the um, hormonal background does not seem to be playing an important role in this disease. So I probably, I wouldn't worry about that. I'll just provide a Wikipedia update. Um, <laughs> so the, the, that reference is not actually a paper, it was an abstract, so that means it was presented, but it wasn't really ever reviewed by anyone, and it came from a uh, UK registry of what appear to be very severe uh, patients with JIA, uh, ending in 2012, so not particularly distant, but it looks like all of the patients were on a lot of medicines and had long-standing disease. So uh, I, I, I would take that with a big grain of Wikipedia salt. Um, one of the things that I've, I've really been appreciative of is the community that we see here in this room and with you all collectively on this stage. Um, we have an awesome rheumatologist, Dr. Oliver, in, 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 at Riley, and her counterpart does a good job of getting out into the community. How can we encourage other rheumatologists within that same practice to participate and be out there and grow that community? Because it seems like the newer doctors want to be engaged, but some of the doctors that have been there for a long time don't have the same enthusiasm. Well, every, every day has 24 hours. <laughs> and um, sometimes the senior doctors are, um, you know, asked by the hospital more or less nicely to push all the paperwork. And I can tell you for myself, once you looked at a foot of paper and answered 200 emails per day, uh, there may not be time to do anything else. Sometimes younger doctors have a little bit more time, you know, available for those things. And I, I feel strongly that everybody should kind of do the level of work at the best of their ability and enthusiasm. So I wouldn't necessarily say they're not enthusiastic, but it may well be that they have so many other things on the plate they need to be doing to make the whole division work so that they don't get to it. I have a related question. Um, we always hear about how few pediatric rheumatologists there are, and I know our particular um, rheumatologist has an incredible caseload. Um, why, why is that? And is there anything that we as a community can do to change that in the future? <laughs> yeah. I think, I th 
I think we work hard to try to increase the number. So uh, even we have reached out to um, second year medical students and up much more so in the past 10 years trying to, so we've increased the people that come and rotate with us from somewhere around 25 to over 150 a year. But still, um, we have in this country 40 training spots for pediatric rheumatologists, and on average, we get about 25 people to apply for those 40 spots. So um, I, I think one thing is, you know, this is a field where you have to like to solve puzzles, and, um, you know, that there are not a lot of people that... Um, no, not that you don't do that in all of medicine, but we don't have us test for anything that we diagnose. You have to take multiple pieces of a puzzle. So, so we get outstanding people that become pediatric rheumatologists because they really love to um, think about things and problem solve. But it's, um, and it isn't one of the more highly paid um, specialties. And I think this is recognized really as a system problem. And, you know, rheumatology in general is anticipated to have a workforce shortage. Some of that is for the adult side, the aging population, developing osteoarthritis, et cetera. Um, but it's, it's recognized, so the, the rheumatology, the American College of Rheumatology and the Rheumatology Research Foundation have put a lot of their efforts towards that workforce development question, right? So how do you encourage young doctors in training to consider rheumatology and pediatric rheumatology? and then those already in the field sort of helping them grow and nurture their, their careers. Um, as, as Jennifer alluded to, that, that pediatrics is interesting because when you think about adult medicine, the specialists are the ones who make the bucks, and in general, general pediatricians make more money than specialist pediatricians. Um, so, and that's then another thing, working to help um, from the, the federal level, working to help um, specialists pay off loans so there isn't as much of a burden of student debt. Um, so, uh, so those are things from a more macro perspective that are being done in organizations that um, are trying to work on that problem. There is, there is, uh, there is actually some initiative in, 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 the, in the government where uh, if you go into pediatric rheumatology, you can apply for uh, getting some of your medical school loans repaid if you are in an institution that does research. So that has actually also helped and that was due to advocacy and uh, to educate more, pay, um, more doctors in pediatric rheumatology and make them remain in research so that new medical knowledge can be and will be gathered. I think the other thing is to remain optimistic because of people like Dr. Lovell and our superb research team because uh, I'm not quite as old as Dr. Lovell, but I'm not too far behind. And, um, you know, we have to give a lot of credit to those people because they helped these kids when we didn't have all these medications. And so even if you were interested in rheumatology when you were at my age, you had to have a really special heart to, to help these poor kids that didn't have these medicines. So now with better research with the SJA Foundation, uh, you know, I think that we will continue to attract more people to this field because there's more that we can do. You know, it really, really took a special kind of person before we had all this treatment to help these kids. And I, I grew up in West Virginia and went to medical school there, and we didn't have a pediatric rheumatologist. We still don't. Um, we are getting, are we getting one? Great. We're sending someone here. Okay. So, which is wonderful. So, I think there's still a handful of states who don't have pediatric rheumatologists. So, a big portion of it, I think, is exposure. I went to a residency program where there was someone, and I followed him, and I happened to just pick that rotation, and I was really amazed by it. So, you know, from your standpoint, if there's something that you can do, if there's a medical school or somewhere, something nearby, just Sharing your stories, I think that that personal component can impact somebody who's not sure what they want to do. Um, so just kind of getting the word out and understanding the disease, uh, the different diseases, the interestingness. I think some of the medical TV shows that are out there aren't wonderful. They're great dramas, but a lot of times we get referred to as Dr. House. Um, so again, in that sense, there's a little bit of awareness for good or for bad. Um, so, so those kinds of just, again, spreading the word about what you go through, what you do, what you see us do, I think can be, can be helpful too. So I have always felt after my son was diagnosed that he had a change cognitively and behaviorally. And it's recognized with Bechet or with lupus. Um, I just am wondering about a myeloid plaques on the brain or inflammation in the brain, things like that. 
Was he taking steroids? He's never taken a steroid. The only, he's only Anna Kenra ever. Could it be, could it have anything to do with coping with the disease? I don't believe so. Or maybe he's just an outlier, I don't know. Well, every, every person is special. Uh, there's some, um, there's some auto-inflammatory diseases, not systemic JAA, where there is some brain involvement. Um, I don't know, like in a NOMID syndrome, I don't know, you've certainly heard about that, but um, that's more like extreme cases. I mean, and yesterday in the group, almost everybody in the room said their kid had headaches a lot, and um, some had even had overt psychoses. And I, I have no noticed that in systemic JIA. We certainly see it in other diseases, but I don't think SJIA is one of those. Um, I was just wondering, with the MAS, when we were diagnosed, I had never even heard of that term until I joined the Facebook group. Do you guys typically educate new parents of, with that guy diagnosed with SJ about MAS and what it is and what to look for? Because I'd never even heard of it. It's, it's probably one of the most overstudied topics in, in rheumatology research right now. I mean, uh, it's actually a complaint of some of the people in pediatric rheumatology who don't study MAS is that uh, people like us are constantly going to the conferences and talking about MAS. Um, so I would say that awareness is certainly rising. Um, it's starting to trickle into places that are not full of peds rheumatologists, like intensive care units and adult rheumatologists. Um, so I think uh, it's, it's tough because it's not a diagnosis that it's easy to draw a line around. Um, uh, we have criteria for MAS, but they're, they're uh, somewhat nonspecific and they're probably mostly useful in the context specifically of system HIA. And so it's a little hard for people who aren't pediatric rheumatologists to know what to do with that. Uh, it's probably an entity that people have been seeing for hundreds of years uh, and just called it sepsis or just called it uh, overwhelming systemic inflammation without uh, a little more of the nuance that, that we have now. But I would say that um, I'm hopeful at least that uh, awareness is really rising uh, and, and be interested to see what others have to say. I, so I, I do men talk about it with all my new patients um, because I think it's important that if you're having an unexplained fever or changes in sort of alertness and energy level that it's that we would consider that an emergency you know there's I can count on one hand the number of times as a fellow I came into the ER in the middle of the night and they but often they were because of a patient who had MAS or were worried about MAS because they were potentially critically ill um, we don't have a lot of emergencies in rheumatology um, but I think it's what we'd really like to know is be able to have better tools for saying who's at risk for MAS and who isn't, because I would say a majority of patients with systemic GIA never have MAS or are close to MAS, and some have frequent MAS, and some are somewhere in the middle. Uh, and, but we don't have good predictives, whether it's from labs or genetics or et cetera, to be able to say who's in which group. But I think it is important to spend time as you get to learn about systemic JAA, because it is a life-threatening manifestation. So just to alert people that if your child gets a fever, you know, contact us and we can help you sort through it. Or uh, if you go to the primary care doctor and they're not quite sure, they should contact us. I think it, it's important for you to be aware, even though it may never happen to your... I think your question was what exactly you need to watch for, correct? And I Right, but, but, but check, usually, usually these patients become looking not well, but the early signs are usually found in uh, laboratory evaluation, and you need to watch for three things. Inflammatory markers like CRP, it goes up, uh, and at the same time, platelets goes down. In classic systemic JIA, platelets usually go up. Uh, and the third feature is increasing ferritin. So. CRP goes up, platelets move down, ferritin goes up. So these three things should make you think about the possibility of um, early stages of macrophage activation syndrome.
When you're sitting at home, I think there's three things you need to think about. One is a persistent fever. So the systemic J fever for most of your children goes up fewer, few hours and comes down. Um, the fever that's characteristic for MAS is more of a persistent fever. Um, so it stays up longer and may be up consistently or stays up uh, most of the day. Um, the other thing is that the child has an altered uh, awareness, alertness. So if your child, even when their fever goes down, if they're still very fatigued, very tired, or not paying attention to what you're saying or what's going on around them, that's another key issue that's an early manif clinical manifestation of MAS is an alteration in their alertness or their attention to what's going on around them. Um, and the other one is when the fever goes down, if their physical activity is still quite limited, they're, they're just laying around even though their fever's down. You know, with systemic JIA, even with active arthritis, once the fever goes down, there's an, a, a kind of an awakening and a more alertness, and they're more interested in playing. But if <clears throat> the fever curve is persistent, uh, if they're uh, they're not as aware as they normally are of their surroundings, and if their energy level is still low despite the fact the temperature goes down, those are all early indicators that this is not just a flare of the systemic JIA. And it's, and it's also not just your usual cold, because even with usual colds, when the fever goes down, the kids are a little more energetic. have a follow-on question. Do we know what a child feels like when they're having an episode of MAS? Um, so I have a three-year-old, and so I've always wondered, is he feeling like he has a cold, or is he feeling like his whole body hurts, or do we have a sense from older children, or from maybe other people in the room who have older children, like what they're feeling when they're experiencing that acute MAS? Profound fatigue and disinterest in what's going on around them. I don't think MAS is necessarily painful, uh, but it really uh, affects your uh, alertness, and, and many patients anyway, affects your alertness and interest in what's going on around you. So that's what I find to be most characteristic of kids who have MAS. Just to answer, um, we have a 12-year-old. She was nine when she was diagnosed. Her symptoms, she just kept saying, is like, I just can't get it. I can't do anything, Mom. Like, the typical things that she wanted to do, she couldn't. It was that increased fatigue. But then the sliding of the feet, she's like, I just don't want to walk. That was her thing with the chronic fatigue and not wanting to eat and then getting extremely frustrated because she couldn't do all that. And I know that I've asked her because... We've reached out to like different people who have younger kids and they're like, they can't tell me. And so hearing it from her is just feeling like that constant, I'm not my normal self. And not she still couldn't put it into words. And still to this day, sometimes she's like, I just can't, I don't know how to explain it. It's just different. Um, but the fatigue is the biggest part of it. Okay, different question. Okay. Um, first, all um, the panel that is up there, I have to say, and from personal experience, um, the passion that you all have is so appreciated, and from the families in the room, but from the professionals, because I, my daughter had been diagnosed for about six years, and I feel like I've been behind the eight ball trying to figure out what it is, that I've been educating myself and trying to uh, look at what is real, what may not be, what's false on online. And then I got into the group and that helped. But meeting everyone that's up there, and most of you I have, um, I just appreciate you. And so one of the things that I would like to know, though, um, and why it was so difficult for us in getting a diagnosis or treatment is because my daughter's labs always looked normal. And our GI doctor would always say, well, they're normal for mache. Um, but when we look on the, uh, speak within the community of parents, 
it, it, it almost is like a 50-50 where parents are saying, yes, our, our child's labs were lo normal also. So it was difficult getting a diagnosis because the doctors we were working with, they weren't looking at the fever, they weren't looking at the rash, they weren't looking that my child couldn't walk. And now I, I see that I feel like that has more to do with some of the more significant issues that she has now, not as much as systemic issues, but with the joint involvement, you know, having the TMJ surgery and having the hips, you know, I, because it was missed for so long. So how do we get, I don't know how you make another person have passion for the job that they're in, they just should. But when looking at the labs or looking at what these symptoms are, how do we get it more across the board? And, and how can we help with that? I'm, I'm here for it. And I live close to a research hospital, but I choose to come here because of that. It gives my daughter better, better treatment. Well, I can speak to the passion part um, because... I've been here the longest, and all these people that are here are hand-picked. And they're picked partly because of their intellect, but mostly because of their passion for their work. Because if you have people that are truly passionate about what they do, then they drive their own uh, excellence and research and high-quality clinical care. So all the people that are in this center were hand-picked because of passion among other things. But I think it is critically important that people have passion about their work. Um, it, f I think for most, excuse me, for most of us, the photo session was just the best because you had all those kids up here uh, doing kid things. Uh, and, you know, that's, those are the reason we come to work every day is because we get to interact with children and adolescents and, and people like that and help them get through this difficult time. So uh, that was just compelling to me to have all those kids have Systemic J be on the stage, and that's the reason that all of us do what we do. Uh, and and your, your observation of 50% is, I think, right on the mark when we were doing research to come up with outcome measures for determining response to therapy in JA patients, we found that around 40 to 50 percent of children with significant arthritis, arthritis of multiple joints, 20, 30 joints, about 40 to 50 percent of them would consistently have normal inflammatory markers on their lab tests. So uh, for many children, it's not an informative test. Uh, and so uh, it is an important message. It's one that we stressed in each one of our talks. We said the systemic J is a diagnosis of exclusion. There's no one lab test that says yes or no that that's what it is. And so it's, it's all a very, still very much a clinical-based um, practice where we put the puzzle together for the child based on history and physical primarily, not so much on lab tests. But... Um, your observation about 50% is exactly what the data shows for GI patients. Hmm. 
Well, I know that Dr. Lovell is a very good doctor. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, what I hear repeatedly, and uh, seemingly we don't have given you a good answer, how can we spread the knowledge and the expertise that, over he that is over here? What we do do uh, is uh, um, serving as visiting professors over the con uh, all over the country and talk to other pediatricians about our diseases. Dr. Huggins has been doing that as part of an ACR effort. Dr. Hendrickson has been doing as Pretty much everybody here on the stage is doing that on in regular intervals. Um, there's only as many of us, but we do spread the message, and maybe that'll be a way, you know, to you know, give presentations to other uh, pediatricians about what systemic JA looks like, what macrophage activation syndrome looks like. Um, sure, one can read articles, but sometimes the articles don't really convey all the intricacies. So that may be a way to spread the knowledge to you know areas like West Virginia. So all the poor people that rotate with us in the clinic hear my soapbox about the phone calls from the ER. We have a patient here. We want you to see what labs do you want, and that's why I might need blood pressure medicine. So it's, uh, there are a few, uh, you know, like rheumatoid arthritis, there needs to be a few laboratory abnormalities to make that diagnosis. So it's just going to take time to let people know that because we do order a lot of blood tests, but uh, those are in support of what we're thinking about or medication monitoring or whatever. So it's just going to take some time, especially for this generation that's very, they need data driven. Uh, and for us, we're just trying to teach them that the data is in the person and in the parents that come w with the history. But I think it, it'll, it, it'll happen. It's just unfortunately going to take you know, some time. And then we're also consumers of healthcare. So um, I learned from a personal experience that uh, I will never again will I stick with a doctor that I was the chief resident and someone that I knew in medical school was the best, but he certainly didn't have the passion, but we stuck with him. And now, so I, I'm just going to go to someone else if I don't get you know, what, what I'm looking for. So there are many, many doctors out there with passion and love for what they do. And if you don't get one, then go to, go to someone else. Yeah. And that stays true for most pediatric rheumatologists. Most but, pediatric rheumatologists go into the specialty because they have the passion. So it's not, it's not in any way uh, a typical of just this site. Most of pediatric rheumatologists I know uh, truly love what they do and love their patients. And so there is a uh, widespread in our specialty uh, a, a passion for what they do. That's why they came there in the first place. If I may make uh, some comments, I mean, what you're saying definitely as the foundation that we've noticed that, you know, different centers have different, um, let's say, passion for a, dis a rare, complex disease like systemic JIA. And right now, our strategy is for patients who need help to help them drive to centers where we know they will get the kind of help they need. But I, I, we understand that that's not a great medium or long-term strategy. Um, and you know, I don't know what the, our medium and long-term strategy should be right now. But I, I do recognize that right now, that's what we are doing is sending uh, trying to get patients to go to the centers where, and I think Leah does this a lot too, to like, you know, when you, when you see a new patient come in who needs some help, to try to direct them to a center where they'll be able to get the kind of help they need. I think in terms of education, I think somebody who's done an excellent job is actually Karen of the Auto-Inflammatory Center, where she's really educated a lot of different doctors and centers about the different types of, um, you know, uh, auto-inflammatory diseases. Um, I don't know what the analog would be in SGIA because it's a kind of a different beast, but um, it is possible, it is doable. She's done a very commendable job. And, and actually, like on the same topic, I think one thing, one thing we realize that we, that this, your center is an excellent center for second opinions. And second opinions help patients in many different ways. Sometimes they keep coming here. Sometimes they go back, but they are able to talk to their doctors better. Sometimes, you know, just in the many ways it helps. And I think that if there was more information, and, and you, you've, you have all the setup for doing second opinions, including the great doctors, but also an office staff who is able to work out the insurance 
um, you have a social worker who's able to help patients with the financial, uh, you know, any needs they have and helping them get flights, etc. You just need to put that all information together on the web page. And we'll, we'll keep pushing from our side too, and that's what we did. But I think that there should be like a second opinions in SJIA, and these are the things that, you know, we can do, which I think will help drive more people and help patients. And I think she's been waiting for a long time. <laughs> Um, I wanted to say one thing about the um, mental health. A lot of, well, in our Facebook group, you see a lot of um, executive functioning issues with SJA. Um, <clears throat> it's usually with the ones that are older in school and having try, trying to keep their own papers together and things like that. So um, I don't know if that's something you've looked into. But my primary question is, I've seen comorbidity um, diagnoses with um, lupus. And how do you decide if it's lupus or SJIA with the symptoms being so close? Uh, and people are saying that you have both. You know, I, when I was a medical student, I had a, a colleague said he would never go into rheumatology because the diseases all sound alike and the treatments back then induce the same symptoms of the disease. So he said it makes no sense at all to go into a specialty like that. <laughs> but there are, there are differences between then and, and uh, I mean, lupus can be a very confusing disease to diagnose up front. There's a whole myriad of symptoms that can be the initial manifestation of the disease and can be very nonspecific. And even when they're diagnosed, there's a whole wide variety of symptoms that one can get. But um, uh, I would say that to have systemic JIA and to have lupus, both diagnoses, is extremely bad luck because they're very different etiologies, right? Different pathways to get the disease. Uh, I would say that probably if a person carries two diagnoses, one of them is not accurate. They either have systemic JIA or they have lupus. Uh, they can look somewhat similar up front, but, but um, uh, you know, it, uh, one of the exclusion criteria for systemic JA is other autoimmune diseases that can appear similar. So that's one of the exclusions. So I would say in a person who thinks they have both those diagnoses, they've been misled. Uh, but it can be confusing up front. Uh, and sometimes it's only with tincture of time that the things sort themselves out. If it starts with fever and and fatigue, then that can go a hundred different ways. Uh, if it's fever and fatigue and then they get the rheumatoid rash, the systemic J rash, then things are becoming more clear cut. But even fever, fatigue, and arthritis can go still very many different ways. So uh, sometimes we have to be follow patients over time to see how things more fully evolve over time to be able to make an accurate diagnosis. Well, both lupus and systemic JA can affect the inborn immune system. Actually, in lupus, it is thought currently that both the inborn and the adaptive immune system are involved and that the interplay between the two abnormalities then call, uh, cause you know, give uh, features of the disease. And many of the autoimmune diseases or rheumatic diseases have overlapping symptoms, it's like fevers, rashes. So if you don't look closely, you may actually diagnose people with two different diseases, but that's where the expertise comes in to sort that out. With respect to the executive functioning, we have developed at the center software where we can screen for cognitive, be cognitive ability in children. The software can be used for children as young as eight years of age. So if there is an interest, we can offer it. We have been consistently offering it to children who have lupus because they are the abnormalities or the problems are better described. But if there is a need for systemic JIA children, we can do that. I think that would be excellent because we have, um, we, I had some frustration with my daughter. She was doing all of her schoolwork and not turning any of it in. And I mentioned it on Facebook and it like blew up there were 10 or 12 other kids doing the exact same thing. And I thought that was just her being her. 
you know, but then every time there are little things like that, it just blows How up. How old? Um, she started that when she was 11, and well, she's never, we've never been able to get her to stop. It may also be the middle school syndrome. My son yes. doesn't have systemic JA, but I can tell you he suffered from the uh, same disease, and it, you know, it yes. almost gave me a disease myself. Yes. Could be exposure and, to And you know, the Xbox, I took the Xbox controller to work so that he couldn't play at home because the battery taking out was not sufficient. So, so I do want to point out that, that the entity that we call macrophage activation syndrome is increasingly recognized as happening in lupus as well. And because adult Stills disease, which is a silly name, is, is less common in adults, uh, the most common cause of macrophage activation syndrome in the adult population is actually a complication of lupus. So it can get really muddy when you have the high ferritin and the low cell counts. Uh, at the onset of disease, which is when M MAS is often uh, most present, to, to tease those things out. But with time and, and often with biopsies or, or more advanced testing, we should be able to tease out most of those differences. I think there's a caution that you need to practice here, is learning disabilities is a fairly common problem in all children, uh, right? So if you have 300 families on your network and you're asking about a complication that occurs with 20 to 30 percent frequency in the general population, you're going to get people that say, oh yes, we have the same problem. The, the tricky part is whether you say, well, it's just by chance that if you had 300 patients uh, and, a, and a, an other completely unrelated problem exists in 20% of the general population, just by coincidence, you're going to have at least a handful of people have the same thing. I, my experience with my three children, none of whom had a rheumatic disease, is exactly the same as yours. Uh, we went through misery with our kids, getting them to turn in homework or do, you know, executive level functioning uh, and it turns out with testing that all three of them had learning disabilities. And so, uh, you know, if you were to say how many children in the SGI network have Epstein-Barr virus disease, well, you would find a large number, or mono, you know, you would find a large number say, yes, my child had mono. And so you have to be cautious that you don't make an assumption that is truly related to the disease as something that may just be coincidental with it being frequent in the general population. Hello. <laughs> um, my daughter was diagnosed three years ago and she started out um, on a Kinneret and um, now our rheumatologist has moved us to Humira because she seems to be having less systemic symptoms and more um, just arthritis, arthritis symptoms. Is that pretty common or? It does happen. In some, in some children with uh, systemic JA, they seem to be responding to um, medication like Humira. And we have done clinical trials here and participated in international clinical trials where uh, children with systemic JA benefited from TNF blockers. I think what is important is once you start a medication to make sure that it works. And so uh, we used to be giving medication a long time to work because we didn't have a lot of them. But nowadays the mantra is that we try it for three months if it works good. And if not, then we look, need, uh, need to look for something else. Dr. Morgan, uh, had like talked about the learning system and that's part of the activities we are doing to find the best sequence of medications. I think the, the reality is for most patients with systemic J, the systemic features uh, can die away or for many patients with systemic features, the systemic features die away and then you're left with the arthritis that can be mild or more severe. Um, and that may be mirroring a change in the biology of the disease also, so that with time and, and fading away of the systemic features, then tumor necrosis factor uh, may be playing a larger role in driving the arthritis in medicines like Humira, Etanercept, are ideal for treating that 
kind of disease is driven by tumor necrosis factor. So as Hermina said, in, in almost all of the anti, well, in fact, in all of the anti-TNF trials, uh, we included children with systemic JA, but who had not had systemic features for six or 12 months. And their response to the medicine was just as robust as the other children for arthritis. But the anti-TNF agents are not very effective for systemic J when you're the disease of being driven by the systemic features because then other cytokines like IL-1 and IL-6 are more important and tumor necrosis factor is not so important. So I think it's an excellent adjustment to treatment to the phase of the disease. If IL-1 or IL-6 inhibiting agents fail, my, my feeling that sort of these patients do exist who respond to TNF inhibiting agents, but it's still, still not that common. Maybe one or two questions more and then we can wrap up. I have a quick question. Um, her mom and sister have psoriasis. She has ITP. Her brother has lupus. Our son has SGIA. Is it unlucky or is it hereditary? <laughs> Let me give you an answer. I give most of the parents you know, when we talk about where the disease comes from. If you think about it, the immune system is probably the most stupid part of our body. Correct? All of us have had a cold. Now, if your heart was as stupid as, as your immune system, we would all be dead. The heart is, you know, beating quicker when you run. You, you know, it beats when you're sleeping. And even if you're upset and think about something else, it still beats and does its job. So the immune system is a very new part of our body, and it's not working properly. And we know that the immune system consists of many different parts. And depending on the interplay of the different parts, um, one can get symptoms of lupus or psoriasis or thyroid disease. Um, we see, uh, you know, doctors always ask about family history, and that basically goes in the direction to capture that aspect because we know that diseases of the immune system, like asthma, allergies, IBD, uh, systemic JAA, uh, what else is this? Um, psoriasis, they are all diseases where the immune system is too strong, is doing too good of a job, and by accident, because it's not perfect, basically harms the body. I almost shed a tear when you said the immune system was stupid. Well. It's just, no, the heart has one job. Um, I would, I, not to be glib, there, there's reason to believe, so if you look, we talked a bit about these GWAS studies, which stands for genome-wide association studies. Um, millions and millions of dollars have been spent looking for, for these hits. Uh, and interestingly, a lot of the same things keep coming up for diseases that you might not necessarily put together. So the hits for type 1 diabetes are almost the same as the hits for multiple sclerosis, right? And so not diseases that we typically think like, oh, well, that, that makes sense. Um, but the predisposition for autoimmunity uh, often has a lot of these same, a lot of the same players, A20 keeps coming up, IL-23 receptor keeps coming up with these hits. So these small changes in, in, in the genetics that cause predispositions to autoimmunity don't always sort of come out as the same kind. And so maybe some of those are there. Um, what I will often say is, like, there probably is a heritable component, but we're not quite smart enough to do anything with it right now. But in your family, you've got all those autoimmune diseases, psoriasis, inflammatory bowel disease, that sort of thing. And then you have a patient with an autoinflammatory disease, systemic JIA. And so I think lumping the systemic JIA with the other members of your family probably is not the right thing to do. We, we've seen from other large J studies where they've looked at other autoimmune diseases that if a child has JIA, other than systemic JIA, one of the other types of JIA, then other autoimmune diseases like thyroid disease, inflammatory bowel disease, psoriasis, those kinds of diseases are increased in other family members. So what you've observed about your family, I think, has been observed about 
a number of families, but systemic JA doesn't fit within that paradigm. So, um, as this is rare diagnosis, so our, I mean, it's very hard to um, tell the people how they are going on and how they are suffering. Sometimes they are on chemotherapy, sometimes on cyclophosphamide, I mean, cytoxin and cyclosporine. So they get their loop change and they are fa facing the problem as they are growing up. How can we bring, um, bring the awareness in society or in school and when they feel bad, how to um, make their mental health strong? Like uh, they are being teased with Fred, I'm, I'm sorry, with friends and uh, you know, so it's very hard because we don't want to repeat the, their problems in front of everyone. Uh, and what should we do with the children at that time? And how can we make the people understand all at one time? What we have done with some children, and there are probably many solutions, we had our social worker actually go to the class and talk to the children and the teacher to make, you know, to make clear what's going on. Nobody asked for, you know, becoming sick and as I said most people most children taking medications for many other reasons it's just a different medication so uh, heightening the understanding in the gr in the room so that the child doesn't have to do the work all by him or herself seems important I, I hate to bring this up but the problem lies in the name Really, the problem now lies in the name of the disease, systemic juvenile idiopathic arthritis. And you know, you just get categorized as arthritis and you're having all these complex systemic issues which are leading to all sorts of problems. I happen to know what happened to the response you got to your 504. It is, it is you know, as a foundation, we've start, decided to just ignore the naming issue because I think it is too deep, it would be too hard, but Patients struggle and face so many problems. Like if you go there and you say, my child has cancer, I hope nobody has, but like there is a generalized understanding, there is empathy. You go out there and you say, I have SGIA, and there is none because they just don't understand the systemic nature of the disease. And, and that leads to so much pain in these kids' lives. And you know, I don't know what can be done about it, but it is, it is heartbreaking. Well, I can speak to that. There is an effort, an international effort, to come up with different terms for this disease and different diagnostic criteria. And for specifically for systemic JA, the new criteria don't require arthritis to make the diagnosis. So the, criteria, the diagnostic criteria are in evolution. Uh, It'll be a few more years before we come up with new terminology, but there is sensitivity and awareness of exactly what you just said, okay? Uh, but I also must say that for other forms of arthritis, they run up against the same roadblock. When they say they have arthritis, the almost universal response that children get is, no, children don't get arthritis, or I never heard of that, or that sort of thing. So our other children with other forms of arthritis run up against the same ignorance in the community and then and the burden of being the lone ranger and that sort of thing and so the perception in the general community is children don't get arthritis children don't get rheumatic diseases and so this is a burden that's shared by all the children with rheumatic diseases but i i agree with you completely about the arthritis part of systemic jaa it overemphasizes only one of many manifestations of the disease. And so the, the new naming effort uh, is the group that's working on that. Uh, some of us are included in that, are sensitive to that issue, and I think that arthritis will not be in the new systemic JIA name. I but if we have to, if we're still in the middle of doing this validation process. It's gonna take several more years for us to collect the data to support this fairly broad-based change in diagnostic criteria for arthritis in children. So it'll be three, four, five years before you see the new label. What the Arthritis Foundation did a couple of years ago, they actually developed for schools 
uh, a leaflet to educate teachers. What is juvenile arthritis? And actually, it was titled uh, "Children Have Arthritis Too." Who bas that basically laid out what are the symptoms, what are the problems children going to have, and what you know the prejudice that you know children don't have arthritis actually does to the well-being of the children. So maybe that'll be something for the Systemic JAA Foundation to develop, like, you know, a small handout which can be given to the school and, and the kindergartens to educate at a level the teachers will understand. I also have been struck over the years by the weight of getting a letter from the rheumatology team for the school that you take to the school and outlines characteristics of the disease with some specification for your child and then the checklist of here are the things that will help this child in the classroom many of which don't cost them a cent in the school and so we've gotten I think a lot of services for our children uh, just by writing such a, a letter that's informative and then having you take it around to the principal, assistant principal, as well as each of the child's classroom teachers, uh, it puts him on notice that the medical community is paying attention to what's happening in a school for that child. So it's a, kind of a legal document, so to speak. But it also, for many teachers, they're just as ignorant about children have arthritis as the general public, and their reaction is oftentimes one of two extremes. One is, I don't believe that's the case, or, uh, and so they say, you sh we don't need to do things special. Or they say, they're so overwhelmed by the fact that this child has arthritis that they're overindulgent and don't make the child do the homework or do the things that you want your child to be expected to do. So their reaction is kind of one or two extremes. So this provides them the information to say, okay, here are the things in the classroom that I can do to help this child. So perhaps on the SGIA website, you could put a template for one of these letters. We've got one in our clinic that's easily adaptable to a particular child. Uh, uh, and I found that to be a powerful tool for getting services for children in the school. Most of the things we're asking cost the schools little or nothing to make the adaptation. So it's not a you know, a big burden on the school to make those changes. So, yeah. I actually have a comment on this that's more for the parents than for the panel, but a lot of this as we're talking to, whether it's the school where there's some more technical things that need to be worked out, or family, people on the street, it's all about how you frame it. Um, when people ask me what my daughter has, arthritis is the absolute last word that I say in the description. I lead off with life-threatening, life rare, uh, rheumatological auto-inflammatory condition, I detail some of the potential side effects and complications, and by that point, they look pretty scared. And then I say, sometimes there's arthritis with that as well, and then I give the name. And most of the time, that takes care of a lot of the BS that we get from people on the street. And honestly, if you get it from them, forget it. They're probably not worth your time. The people who, are, who will understand and empathize with you are the people that you want to reach out to and make sure they can be advocates for you too. And like I said, it's all about how you frame it. We know the life that we live, and we are the experts when those people are talking to us. So work your spiel, figure out a way to describe it that works for you. And like I said, if you don't like the word arthritis, try and leave it out of the description. We're not the doctors. We don't have to describe it medically perfect every time. Yeah, I would agree with that. And the arthritis, if people, their awareness of arthritis is osteoarthritis in older people, right? And for many of us, that's just one of our daily hassles that you put up with. You have osteoarthritis, you have joint pain, but you keep on going. And so their familiarity with arthritis is more with osteoarthritis, which isn't life-threatening, isn't all that rare. And so I agree with you completely. You need to frame it in a way that emphasizes for SGIA these other aspects of the disease and not so much the arthritis. Thank you so much. Please thank the panel. Um, we'll take a quick break and I think